Brian Smithson is here. He is one of those who was interviewed, and he's going to share a little bit about his story, Ghosts of War. This is when he served in Iraq. And also Rob Spohr, who was one of those who was interviewed, is here as well. And he's going to, going to talk a little bit about the importance of sharing stories through writing with a wonderful organization called Songwriting with Soldiers. Um, Ryan Smithson is one of those who was interviewed for this project, and he felt strongly about doing something after the tragedy of 9-11. He joined the Army Reserve when he was out of high school, and at the age of 19 was deployed to Iraq. He shares his experiences in his book, Ghosts of War, and these books will be available for sale, and Ryan will sign them after the program. So let's give Ryan a very warm welcome. Thanks. And thank you, Gail, for putting this all together. This is like just phenomenal. How many people you've touched and, and helped. Really awesome. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about service, my book, the War and the Army and all that. But first I want to talk about this movie. Who knows what this movie is? Oh yeah. 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 Sandlot. Who has not seen the movie The Sandlot? Yeah. All right. <laughs> you gotta see it. So this movie came out when I was a kid. And uh, those of you who have not, not seen it, I'll give you a little bit of a background story. So the, uh, this is a team of kids and they play baseball in a sandlot in their neighborhood. And the kid in the middle in the white shirt holding the ball, that's Scotty Smalls. And Scotty is new to the neighborhood. He doesn't really know anyone. He's kind of a dork. And he shows up to play with these guys. And he grabs one. He tries to throw it. And it goes about. Does it need to be closer? Yeah, a little bit. All right. Can you guys hear me in the back? Everyone's good? All right. Good. So Scotty shows up. He tries to throw the ball. And it goes about two feet in front of him. And lands there. And uh, he's totally embarrassed. And, so he runs away, and all the other kids are laughing at him. Well, the guy in the end here, Benny, in the hat, he decides he's going to kind of take Scotty under his wing, and he bites him back out, and he's like, nah, I don't, I don't think I want to. And so uh, Benny talks him into it. He comes back out. He shows him how to throw a ball. He shows him how to hit. And the other kids, takes a little while for them to warm up, but they need a ninth guy to play. And Benny's like, come on, give him a shot. So they go through some antics, and then one day... Um, oh, I, I have to mention this. Behind the sandlot, behind the fence, there's this giant man-eating dog named Beast. And so every time they hit a ball over this fence, they can't get it back. And uh, so they're playing, right? And Scotty, uh, they lose a ball. And Scotty says, well, I, you know, I, I got one. Nobody else has a ball. Scotty says, I got one. My, I think my old man's got one. He stepped in. Uh, it's in his trophy room. He doesn't tell anyone it's in the trophy room. He just tells him, I got a ball, I'll go run and grab it. He grabs this ball, he brings it back out, he's playing with it. And Scotty doesn't know anything about baseball. He doesn't know uh, what the significance of this ball was, but he starts playing with it, and Scotty gets his first homer. He gets his first homer with the ball. And everybody's like, yeah, awesome, you made it. And don't worry about it, we'll get another ball. And then he realizes, oh, no, I can't. I can't, I gotta get the ball back from my stepdad. And they're like, don't worry about it, man. We'll, we'll buy a new one. We'll figure it out. He says, no, that ball was special. It was signed by someone. They're like, what do you mean? He said, it was signed by Babe Ruth. And he thinks it's some girl that gave him a gift. He doesn't know anything. So, so then the rest of the story is I'm trying to get this ball back. And they try, and they can't figure out how to do it. And then toward the end of the movie, right before the big climax, Benny has a dream. And in that dream, Babe Ruth visits him. And he says, listen, kid, everybody gets one shot in life to do something great. And most people don't take it. Most people are too scared, or they don't see it when it's right in front of them. And Benny decides he's just got to jump over the fence and get this ball. I won't ruin it for you. Uh, so I went out for uh, baseball. I played Little League. Ended up like that guy. Uh, I was not very good. They stuck me out in right field because I sucked. And... <laughs> Uh, one, one time I actually did catch a fly ball and while I was celebrating, two guys scored. <laughs> <laughs> Baseball was not my thing. Uh, I went out for football, it's not actually me. Uh, but I did football when I was in middle school and, uh, you know, it was alright. But I didn't really love it, I'm kind of a smaller guy. And uh, I 
wonder what my big chance was going to be. It wasn't baseball. It wasn't football. It's not track. Uh, I wonder what was going to be my big shot in life, and was I going to take it? Was I going to be too scared? And so that was sort of what I'm what I'm thinking about as I'm growing up, right? And the movie influenced a lot of people that way, I think. And I got into my uh, senior, or excuse me, got into high school, and I went out for wrestling. And I was talking to my buddy Brian, who I was in a band with, we were in a like, little garage band, we jammed out, and it was the summer before ninth grade. And I was telling him, I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of just like too small, I just don't, I'm not really great at sports, I, it's sort of hard for me to keep up. And he says, why don't you go out for wrestling, you're teamed up against people your own size. And I'm like, all right. So I went with, with Brian to my, to uh, practice that, that first season. And something about it spoke to me. I don't know what it was. I just liked it. And the coach came up to me that first practice and he said, who are you? What are you doing here? Because he knew everyone in the, in the wrestling. They all went wrestling since they were kids and uh, he didn't know me. And I said, I'm Ryan. My buddy brought me in here. And he goes, what do you think? And I said, I, I really like it. And he said, all right, stick around. And I did for all four years of high school. And I was never great. I never won sectionals. I never did anything special. But each year I got better. My first year I, I won one match on JV. <laughs> Uh, my second year, though, I made it to varsity, and I, I won some more in my third year and fourth year. And, uh, I, I ended up doing better than I had done that first year, and that's what mattered. And I, I don't fully know even now what it was about wrestling that drew me to it, uh, but I think what I liked about it is that it's just you. You can't blame it on the quarterback. You can't blame a loss on the pitcher. It's you and you alone. And sometimes you get taken down, and sometimes you get to take the other guy down. And sometimes you lose, and sometimes you win. And at the end of the day, you've got to stand back up and put your toe in that line and go out for it again. And I think that personal accountability is what I liked about it, and uh, <clears throat> it's what got me through a lot of those tougher times that were yet to come in the Army and, and elsewhere. So I was 16, my junior year, and I walk into my American history class, and my teacher says something that I'll never forget. He said, you guys are living history right now. And I never really thought of myself as living history. History was some boring thing I had to study in school and pass a test for, and a bunch of old dead people that didn't really matter to me. But I realized in that day that history is alive, that we are a product of history, whether we know it or not. And I was, in fact, living history. And these young people up here doing what they did today, this is history for them. They don't remember this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really come full circle. So that was what prompted me to want to join. I wanted to do something. I didn't really know what yet. I was only 16. But in my senior year, I decided I wanted to join the Army. And I started talking to a couple different branches, a couple different recruiters. And the reserves was a nice option because I wasn't totally sure if I wanted to do the military thing. I didn't come from a family where everybody served or anything like that. Um, so the reserves gave me that balance and I went in as an engineer. So I would be doing construction, basically. Um, and I went to basic training and that was eye-opening. Uh, that's a drill sergeant. <laughs> and uh, for me, basic training was a total loss of freedom. They take everything you have. They shave your head, and you are not an individual anymore. And it's really antithetical to the way we kind of think of life here in America, that you're a special little star and you need to go follow your dreams with it. And it's, no, shut up and get in line. <laughs> and if you don't, you're going to get somebody killed because the stakes are just that high. So it has to be that way. Everyone relies on each other. And like a wrestling team or like a football team, uh, that... I, I like that about it, that camaraderie. And pushing yourself, the mental toughness, you know, I felt pretty well prepared with, with wrestling. So I came home from my basic training, I came home from my job training, and this was 2004. So the war in Afghanistan had been going on for a couple years, the war in Iraq had been going on for about a year, and if you talk to people who were first there in Iraq, it was, it was simple and easy. It went, it, we toppled Saddam it was over. Uh, you could walk around the streets of Baghdad without body armor, just talking to people. And then the insurgency thing started happening more and more. And so by the time I got deployed, this 
I wasn't infantry, I wasn't cavalry, I was not an airborne ranger or anything like that. Um, but it was an insurgency, it was guerrilla warfare. So if you were out and about, I didn't know where I was going to be going or what I was going to be doing. And that sort of unknown quality of it is one of the, I think, most terrifying things. Um, is you just, you just don't know. You don't know what's going to happen day to day. And so before I left, uh, my girlfriend Heather, who I had in high school, and who's here tonight uh, with our kid, um, she had been there through basic training. She had been there through job training. She had been there when I was thinking about enlisting, saying, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> Why would you think to do that? Uh, and so I didn't, I didn't think it was right to leave her without a ring on her finger. The Army doesn't care about your girlfriend. They don't care about your fiance unless they're your next of kin. They don't get that phone call if something happens to you. So we got hitched real quick, shotgun style, when I found out I was being deployed. End of 2004, uh, we had our reception at Buca de Pepo <laughs> down in Albany because uh, we needed a place on short notice that could hold like 30 people. And so that was it. So we got married and then I left. I went over to, uh, first I met my unit in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I did not know anyone from my unit. My reserve unit back home was in Kingston, but I wasn't deployed with them. I was deployed with a unit out of West Virginia. We met in North Carolina. We had people from all over the states. One guy was from Hawaii. We had a bunch of people from Texas, Alabama, North Dakota, you name it. We had people from all over. I was the only one from New York. Closest, closest person was in uh, New Hampshire, uh, a couple hours away from here. So uh, I didn't know anyone. I show up at Fort Bragg and it's training time. You, get to know each other and you train and you figure out what you're going to do. And then we went over to Kuwait. Uh, we flew over there for um, three weeks, three, four weeks, just training up. We had all our engineering equipment, so the Navy brought that stuff up to the Persian Gulf. We picked it up in uh, a little port city in Kuwait. We got it all up and running, and then we pushed north into Iraq. So that's my platoon sergeant. Uh, that's my buddy Scott behind me. And then that's uh, the dump truck that I drove. So I was licensed to drive in the Army a uh, five-ton dump truck, uh, bulldozer, scraper, loader, and a grader. So that's what I operated. So basically all the stuff you see on it, like a construction site. That's what I was operating. But we had all these other pieces of equipment, in these giant 20-ton dump trucks. We had uh, tractor trailers. We had all sorts of stuff. And so in Kuwait, one of the things we had to do was cross-train on all these other things we might have to drive during the year. Uh, they let us license ourselves on whatever we want because it was just quick and easy. So we had this like license printed out with all these vehicles. Um, somebody figured out, could have been me, uh, what the license number was for a motorcycle. So we, we all licensed ourselves on motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did the motorcycle. But we figured might as well have the license for it. So <laughs> you do things kind of quick and dirty in the Army sometimes. So anyway, we... Uh, that was my dump truck. I had driven it one time before that just to get familiar with it. It's, a, it's like a stick shift, and I had my platoon sergeant in my passenger seat. And then because we had so many people, we had a bunch of guys in the back. We had met, we had made, we had like makeshift welded these like mounts for, for weapons so we could hang over the side if we needed them. But they were just standing on duffel bags, all of our gear, and just driving up north for three days into the center of Iraq. And <clears throat> Iraq is... Um, not like Kuwait, right? Kuwait's very pro-American. Iraq, we knew there were people there who were not pro-American and who were trying to kill us. And so um, you just don't know what to expect. You have no idea. And the only thing I knew about the Middle East before joining the army was uh, people, you know, burning flags and, and whatever else. And so that's kind of what you expect. You don't know if that's going to happen. And we get to our first village, and it's kids lying in the streets. They're all and thumbs up, they're begging for food. Uh, a lot of them didn't have shoes on. And it was, for, for me, and I know for a lot of my unit, it really became human for us very quickly. It was not about the politics. Uh, it wasn't even fully about the mission. I mean, it's always about the mission. Uh, but wherever we were, wherever we could do, it was, we did what we could for those, for those kids, because those were the, that's the future, right? Those kids are not, those are the ones who are going to decide whether the war means anything, not politicians, not the news media. And so we wanted to have a positive effect on these people. It's, it's 
you know, we're just going to be there doing construction, but if we can throw them water uh, when they need it, if we can throw them MREs and stuff. Uh, one of my buddies said, you know, if we can't share water in a desert culture, we're not going to accomplish anything here. Uh, and one of our operating procedures, what he was talking about, is uh, we weren't allowed to throw water from our vehicles because kids were getting hit in the street and stuff, so that's bad PR for the Army, but uh, we did it anyway. Uh, so this is, we were winding, this is the Tigris River, so all, all, the, all the youngsters out there studying Mesopotamia and, and Babylon and all that good stuff, it's, it's right here. So this is the Tigris River, and there was a bridge that went over it for the military, there's a civilian bridge next to that, you can see on the left, and then there's this road that was going over, that, uh, there was like this hairpin turn that we had to widen because some of the bigger trucks were getting caught there, they couldn't get around it, and uh, bad stuff was happening. So. We came out and leveled this land. Well, the, the local sheik came out and was talking to our lieutenant. And he said, hey, there's a family right next to where you guys are working that had a bad year from erosion from the river. Do you mind bringing them some good dirt? Because we were bringing dirt there anyway from a borrow pit. And uh, they got shoveled wheelbarrows, and we have 20 ton dump trucks. So we're like, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll. So we stayed out there for an extra week, and we brought them a whole, whole bunch of dirt and helped out that family. The women at that village came out and brought us flatbread the one day. Um, so it was stuff like that that, you know, we're there doing road work for the Army, but uh, anything we could do for the people was really what I think mattered. This is another mission. Uh, we did this a lot. So the, the dust over in Iraq is like moon dust. It's, like, it's not even like sand. It's not like a beach. And when it gets wet in their <coughs> wet season, which was what we call winter, uh, it just rains there, and it turns into like peanut butter. It's disgusting. Uh, so we would, on a lot of bases you see stones, a lot of pictures of like bases overseas, you'll see stones everywhere, that's why it helps minimize some of that dust, and for dust storms, it uh, keeps stuff at bay. And also, this was, this in particular was in, the, in downtown Samara's little infantry post we were working with, and we uh, put this outside their post because people were digging in the dirt, which is easier to dig in than rocks, and hiding mines and all sorts of stuff. So there's a number of reasons we spread rocks everywhere. So we would take them from a borrow pit and bring them rocks and, you know, this is like just hot, dirty, dusty work. That They don't make video games about this stuff. Uh, but, <laughs> but it's a very important part of the military doing what it does. Uh, we were attacked on this, on this mission. Uh, we didn't lose anyone, but a lot of, a lot of civilians uh, and Iraqi army soldiers who were allies at that time were, were killed in that. Um, but they were going after us. Uh, that's the infantry post. I think it was a hospital or something. And the infantry uh, occupied it for the interim to try to keep peace in Samara. Samara was kind of a hotbed. A lot of, a lot of people there who didn't want us there. <clears throat> this is Abu Ghraib prison. So we were leveling land. In Abu Ghraib, that's myself on the left and my buddy Green on the right. Uh, the uh, Abu Ghraib is right outside of Baghdad. It's right in that Fertile Crescent part of Iraq. And so part of being the Fertile Crescent is there is a lot of groundwater. You don't always know where it is. And so we're digging and, and doing what we do. And this was like hard packed. The ground is very hard. It's like concrete. And until we went a little too deep trying to clear some of this land out and one of our dozers got stuck, so we had to get another dozer and hook up chains and pull it out, and that dozer got stuck. <laughs> so then we had to, and it just became like this sinkhole. It was just madness, and it extended our mission forever. Um, so we had to get a hydraulic excavator and like hook up chains to pull the one dozer out and then the other dozer out. Uh, so that was fun. But you can see the, the, the dozer tracks are totally buried in the mud there. This is also something we did a lot. So you'll see these. These are called Hesco barriers. You'll see these a lot in pictures from Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we just, they're just big sandbags, just filled with dirt. Nothing too special. Uh, this was, I think we were making a fuel station or something at a, at a base up north by Mosul. That's a dust devil. So in comparison, you see that little square on the left? That's a tractor trailer. See how big this thing is? And I write about this in the book. Um, but that, that tractor drill is going by, and you don't halt a convoy for anything. You never want to stop. You want to just keep moving. Even when something blows up, you move. You can't. So this thing came across the road, and I drove right through the middle of it. And I had no idea what was going to happen. I'm like, oh my god. But I wasn't going to stop. 
So I just went through, it was fine, but pretty wild. Uh, he runs into some weird stuff. This is a sandstorm. Uh, when that happens, you have to stop because you can't see anything. I mean, you can't see more than 50 meters ahead of you. So we would just stop and hope nobody tried to attack us, and we'd just hang out until it cleared and then keep rolling. So this is our day to day. We're just moving around, doing stuff. Um, a lot of beautiful scenes in Iraq. It's a very old country, there's a lot of history. Uh, in the winter, when there is clouds, there's not clouds otherwise, but when there is clouds, it's very pretty. And it's some very beautiful architecture. You've got a very super old country, a lot older than ours. And then there's the not so pretty parts of Iraq and the stuff that you don't talk about when you come home. And um, the army really, whoops, too far. The army really trains you to shut things off, to ignore stuff. Because if you think with your heart, when those bullets are flying, you're going to get yourself killed. You're going to get somebody else killed. So you have to think with your head. You have to rely on your training. And what they don't do such a great job of is, is teaching you how to be human again when you come home. And it, for me, all those emotions and things that I was just sort of like stuffing down and ignoring because I had to for the mission, it didn't disappear, it's still there. I was just ignoring it. And they started to come up on their own and I was having night terrors and things. And you know, some people go through a lot, a lot worse uh, I didn't have it so bad, but you don't know what to do, and you feel ashamed. And luckily for me, about a year after I got back, um, I hadn't talked about it again. You're just kind of scared, and you're ashamed of yourself, and so you don't talk about it. But the problem with that is those good things that we were doing, that also doesn't come out. So civilians don't know what it's like. They don't know what we're really doing over there. And that's a problem. And it's, uh, and you know, I was very bitter when I came home. I was mad that nobody knew. But it's up to us to make sure people know. And that's why events like this are so important, to, to have that dialogue, to talk, uh, for people to listen. And fortunately for me, about a year after I got back, I wrote an essay for an English class at Hudson Valley. And it felt very therapeutic to get it out. I just, I just wrote this essay. Um, I didn't really expect to do anything with it. Looking back, I think it was easier for me to write that essay and give it to a, a professor who I didn't know versus giving it to my wife or talking to my wife about something because the professor was impartial. Um, if she said, yeah, good job, B+, plus, whatever, no harm, no foul. Um, but if my wife said, I don't want to know this stuff, that would have killed me, right? So I wrote this thing, I gave it to the professor, and she said, you need to keep doing this. You need to keep writing. You obviously have a story to tell. When I told her that it felt therapeutic, she said, you definitely need to keep doing it. And she asked me if I was seeking therapy. And I said, no, I, I, a little while after, about a year after that, I actually did end up going to the, the VA for some counseling. But um, it started with that sort of door opening with the writing. And being able to, I think what was therapeutic is being able to process it, to own it a little bit, to realize that I had learned lessons that were important and that were worth sharing with people. And that all came through that writing. And so I kept writing and kept writing with her encouragement. Um, I had a bunch of these stories and I went and I smashed them together and sent it off to try to get it published as a book. And 50 agents that I sent it, the literary agents that I sent it to all said no. One said no, but you're close and here's how you can make it better. So she gave me some feedback. And I, so I was kind of bummed, I was like, man, I really thought I had something here. And I went back to my professor, showed her that letter and she said, you, you are very close. For an agent to take the time to do that, it's huge. So I took that advice serious. I went back, I, I worked at a summer camp. So I would wake up at like five o'clock in the morning and write for a couple hours and go to work. And I did that every day for a summer, rewriting this whole thing. And I sent it back out, another 50 agents. Um, 49 of them said no. And that doesn't matter because one said yes. 
Not that original one, actually. Uh, but another one said, yes, I want to make this happen. So she went to the publishing houses. This was in fall of 2007. It was, there were a lot of Iraq memoirs kind of in the works, so it was a tough market, I guess, to compete with. Um, and she had an idea to go to uh, Harper Collins. She had worked with a uh, young adult editor there. Mm -hmm. Young adult books. I didn't write it for young adult audience. I just wrote it. I wasn't really, I was writing it for myself mostly. And <clears throat> they, they loved it. They jumped on it and said, yeah, we want to do this. And so then I had to do a whole other bout of rewriting for about a year and um, making, really drawing out that YA voice. It was a YA perspective. I was 16 on 9-11. I was only 19 when I was deployed. So it was that. It had that voice. I just had to sort of figure out that's what this story was about and sort of tease that out. Um, so since then, since it came out in 2009, it's in English curriculums all over the country. Um, it's been turned into a play. Totally, I had nothing to do with that. Uh, other than other than write the book, uh, which I guess is probably a big part of that. <laughs> uh, but it got turned into a play, and so um, I've seen it. Three separate actors have played it now. They're actually doing a full run in Chicago where the guy who adapted it for the stage is from. And they're doing that in the spring. And I guess the when they do that run, they invite like influential critics and stuff, and if they give it a good review, it has the potential to tour for like years and years. Or whatever. I mean, none of this. Um, he was the guy who adapted it. Was sitting next to someone on a plane and said, "I want to, I want to do a play, a true story, about a soldier in these wars for young people." And they, that person, I don't know who they are, read, had read my book and suggested it, and so that's how it happened. Um, so pretty wild. And when I look back, and I wonder what my big shot was, and if I took it, you know, obviously the, the play and the book is a big deal and what kind of once in a lifetime opportunity. And I did that, but if I didn't if I didn't have that thing to heal from, if I didn't have that reason to communicate and get through some of that stuff, I wouldn't have written that book. So going to Iraq was was the big shot. Uh, but obviously I wouldn't have been there if I didn't join the army. And I don't think I would have joined the army if I didn't have the wrestling background, if I didn't have that confidence and that mental toughness. I don't think I would have done that until it gets back to the wrestling room because the same lot is wrong you don't get one shot you get them all the time you make choices every day that affect your future and you don't always know if it's the right decision sometimes you can't know and sometimes you fail because that's how it works but you stand back up and you put your toe in the line my buddy Brian never came back for that second wrestling practice. He had wrestled for a few years and he was bored of it and said this sucks and he quit. A couple years later he said the same thing about high school and he quit. He got really hard into drugs. And I saw him a couple years after high school. Our paths had obviously gone different ways and he was totally burnt out. It was hard to even hold a conversation with him. And he was one of my best friends in middle school. I, we were in a band together. I, I easily could have gone that way. And obviously at the time I didn't know that's where life was going and that's where his life was going. But the book is about being broken down and building yourself back up. And you don't do it yourself. You're never alone. But it's on you. You have to do it. You have to want to do it. And so that's what the book is about. And it's about war and it's about all that. But uh, I think the reason Harper Collins saw the potential as a story for young people is because it is that message. Mm -hmm. And to stand up and to share what you've been through. Because your other option is to hold it in forever. And that doesn't do anyone any good. So again, thank you, Gail, for this opportunity. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. Um, I do have some books. I don't know how many I have, but I got a box. Yeah. And we'll see. If does, does we can't get them to you tonight, we'll, we'll figure something out. Does anyone have any questions for Ryan? I was curious about the big bags that Sam was talking about. Yeah. What are those for? Is it just a little bit there? Yeah, bullet catchers, yeah. Oh, bullet catchers. Basically. Yeah, just a perimeter. So you see them on the perimeter of, of, of a base. Yeah, they're about... 
uh, six feet or so. Yeah. Not to get people behind. Anybody else? I noticed um, it looked like some of your armies were really thin skin <laughs> and you were starting to develop maybe some pieces to the back of them. That was during part of the war when there's a lot of emphasis on needing more equipment, yeah. needing more supplies, and being able to counteract the IEDs. Yes, so in the beginning, 2003, we went into Iraq. Um, it was a bombing campaign. We went in and bombed Baghdad, we toppled Saddam. That was the mission. George Bush flew back on an aircraft carrier, landed some mission accomplished, because it was. We, we did it. Um, but then it became nation building, and then the insurgency happened, and it got a little messier. And so Congress didn't really budget for armor on the vehicle. It sounds kind of crazy in hindsight, but they just didn't. Uh, so we were there in 04 to 05, and so during that tour, we had, when we first went into Iraq, we, we actually stole a bunch of <laughs> like makeshift armor that we found in Kuwait, uh, and we put it all over our vehicles wherever we could. Probably wouldn't have done much good, honestly, but it's peace of mind, so. Uh, we put that all over where we could on our doors and stuff, and then by the end of the tour, we had probably 80% of our vehicles had armor on them. Um, the, the, the ones we drove a lot, so the tractor trailers and the dump trucks and the, um, the Humvees, most of them were, were pretty well up armored the right way. Uh, but yeah, we did a lot of that ourselves in Kuwait. We, we just welded. It's one benefit of being an engineer in the Army is you have access to a lot of stuff to <laughs> do what you need to do. Most of us don't have that at the mercy of Congress. Anybody else have a question? Well, Ryan, we do have um, some books here, and Ryan will be signing them, but um, the whole purpose of this program was to share stories, most importantly to share stories with young people, because as you said, they're the future. You said that it was the children that touched you the most, so that was the whole purpose of this. And, you know, there are different ways that people can share their stories, whether it's through writing or sometimes through artwork. And there's, a, there's another one, another way that people can share their stories, and that's through song. And Rob Spore, I have your little bio here, Rob. Rob Spore was one of those who was interviewed, and he is the program assistant for a wonderful national organization called Songwriting with Soldiers whose purpose is to transform lives by using collaborative songwriting that pairs service members with songwriters to expand creativity, connections, and strengths. Songwriting with Soldiers uses songwriting as a catalyst for positive change. So he's going to end our program today with a few words about this amazing organization, and since we opened in song with our national anthem, I thought I would play one of the songs. Sorry, Rob, not your song. Right. His, yeah. his is not child-friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pull up the website here. Yeah, yep. So um, I am Staff Sergeant Robert Spore. Uh, currently, I am an AGR soldier in the New York Army National Guard. I work for Joint Force Headquarters and the Joint Operations Center. So I'm on the night shift. I'll be actually going to work tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I joined the uh, Army National Guard in 2000, and I joined to go to school and just because a couple of my buddies had joined already and they were like, you got nothing going on, so you're gonna join. <laughs> so I, uh, I chose the infantry. I had other choices, but those two guys were in the infantry, so I was with Delta Company, first of the 105th out of Troy, New York. Um, fast forward a couple of years, 9-11 happened, and then uh, we got the call of October of 2003. Uh, we did six months of train up at Fort Drum, and then on Kuwait for a month, and then we drove up to our FOB in the Sunni Triangle, right outside of uh, LSA Anaconda, on a little FOB called Orion. Oh, I was there all the time. 
Yeah. <laughs> when were you? So I was like, oh. uh, oh, four, oh, five. Okay. Same time. Pass, no okay. pass. Yeah. yeah, we did a bunch of work there. Yeah. I filled a bunch of Hescos for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to meet this private Hesco who came up with that. It's probably rich. Um, so uh, we did route clearance, and with the help of the engineers, clearing back the sides of the road, it made our job a lot easier at times. Um, we got hit a lot because we were that hard target that came after them hitting the soft targets, and then we would try and rectify the situation, to put it lightly. Um, so I came back uh, and held everything in, pretty much, and then I took a job with the New York National Guard. I got offered an AGR position, so I stayed in. I, during my time overseas, I plan on getting out and trying to start something else. Um, so, 2007 comes along, I meet my wife, and she's a yoga instructor, and helps me out immensely with uh, meditation, practicing yoga. Um, I went to the VA before, and they tried to put me on drugs and stuff, which didn't work for me. So, I met her, she really helped me out. Um, we owned a yoga studio here in Del Mar. Uh, Mary Judd, who is the co-founder of the Songwriting Soldiers, was one of my wife's clients. And she said, I run these retreats with songwriters that not as therapy, but very therapeutic. And they take four songwriters, professional Grammy award winning songwriters, and take a group of about maybe 10 to 12 service members, not only veterans, but service members, regardless of how long you were in, if you deployed or not. They take this group of people and they have a retreat. You write Friday, Saturday and Sunday, you write songs with songwriters, and then they do a presentation at the end, a nice concert. Um, everything's free to the veteran or service member. Um, so Mary's like, oh yeah, I want your husband to go. Your husband's a vet. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going. To go. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. That's like kumbaya stuff. I don't, I don't get into that. Yeah, you got me doing yoga, that's enough. <laughs> so she... Uh, a couple of years later, uh, I got my yoga teacher certification, and my wife's like, you're going to come with me and, and help teach the yoga, because my wife teaches the yoga at the retreat. So I'm like, okay, I'll do that. I'll help you out. <laughs> so I go, and I actually was a participant, tricked into being a participant, <laughs> <laughs> and came up with a song. Uh, and it was so moving to me that uh, I could just push play on a recording and share my entire story. Like, not my entire story, but a good chunk of it, of what trauma was affecting me and the events. And I could just say, all right, we'll just listen to this. I don't have to talk to anybody. I don't have to like put it out there. And a lot of our folks that have come to the retreats, that's what they say, just push play. And it, it, it changed the way I looked at a lot of stuff, and I really wanted to, after the retreat, I was like, I have to be involved in this. I have to help my fellow service members and help them share their stories. Because every one of these songs is a, a wonderful story, and it's amazing to like, just hear people's different experience, be it combat or civilian side, or, or I mean state side, sorry. Um, but to long story short, my wife and I work for Mary as her assistants, and we handle like admin stuff. Um, I'm very part time with it. My wife is more uh, does a little more than I do because I work a lot of hours with uh, the National Guard still. Uh, I got five years left, and uh, then I'll be retired. But. Um, you want to play the song? Yeah. Yeah, That's all I got. Any questions for me? Or our song, our uh, website is songwritingwithsoldiers.org, and uh, you can get all the information there on the website. Um, just email, and if you know anybody that wants to be a participant, there's a, a retreat, another retreat coming up uh, in probably next October in New York, <coughs> September, October timeframe for New York. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Oh, oh, question. question. Yes, sir. Uh, so where are the retreats? Uh, there's, we usually hold two in New York State. Um, 
There was one, only one here last, actually there was two here last year, one in May, one in uh, okay. September. Okay. So um, and then there was just two, one in Colorado, uh, one in Texas, one in Virginia, and then an Arizona retreat. So it's all over the country. There's uh, retreat centers. Uh, you can look up Boulder Crest, which is uh, founded by a former EOD commander, um, and that's a retreat center that invites us to participate there and, and hold a retreat. Uh, is that in New York? Boulder. No, that's in uh, Virginia. So, What's the one in New York? The one in New York, we uh, at the Cary oh, Institute. Right. Yeah, it's not yeah. far. No. Yeah, it's about 20 minutes from here. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, and it's, it, they take the the areas and, and sites for the retreats are, are just amazing. It's like very serene and, and picturesque, and the, the food's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, not, there's no cost to the participant, and they can bring their family and, and, and just have a great meal. So, thank you. Um, I did have the pleasure of attending the retreat in Rensselaerville in September. And um, one song that really spoke to me that's also age appropriate for the audience is called Castify, and I thought that I would um, end with that. I always loved to fish, yeah, fishing soothed my soul. My summer's filled with a rocky stream. When my country called, I left those streams behind. We played in a sandbox with some friends of mine. I bought a brand new ride and then I was eight years old again. And my favorite place in a whole new different time. We were all proud to serve, but don't we all deserve? Find our lives and set our wounds aside. Me, I wait in the water, cast a fly. I've lost a lot of lines, the current swept away. That keeps me in the moment, it sweeps away my yesterday. I catch them and release them, and I thank them for their fight. And it helps me count my blessings when I turn out the light. So when it's cloudy, I'll be here where there's no guilt and there's no fear. And I'll think about the ones we left behind. We were all proud to serve, but don't we all deserve? Find our lives and set our wounds aside. Me, I wait in the water. Yes, I wait in the water. Me, I wait in the water. Cast a fly. thank everyone for coming this evening. I want to thank the students and Boy Scouts for your dedication, your commitment, and your utmost respect for the veterans and military members that, that you interviewed. And it was my deepest hope that um, you would learn something from that. Just learn a, learn a story um, from someone who was about your age when they went to serve and the great sacrifice that they did and the great sacrifice that our men and women in uniform continue to do. So thank you all for your service.